Welcome to ZanKhan.org. This is Zan Khan. Today we will be interviewing a senior member of the world's most secret and powerful society. They have been so secret that this is the first time any of its high-ranking members have been interviewed on a show. Their secret society is so powerful that the founding fathers of America were members, American presidents and leaders around the world were members. Today we will be interviewing Timothy Hogan, who is an acolyte knight's commander of the Court of Honor within the Scottish Rite, a Grand Master 32 grade Freemason, which is one of the highest ranks in the world, in, in the world of Freemasonry. Today we will be discussing inside the Freemasonry with our guest Timothy Hogan. Timothy Hogan is also a best-selling author on the topic of Freemasonry. Welcome to our show, Timothy Hogan. This is Zan Khan. It's a pleasure to have you on our show. Thank you so much for having me. Timothy, uh, let's get to the first question. What is the brief history of Freemasonry? Where did it originate from? Well, this is a question that even Masonic scholars have tried to figure out for centuries. Um, we know that some of the earliest uh, traditions that were resembled Freemasonry can be found in, in some of the uh, earliest civilizations. But uh, as a society itself, uh, the, the earliest Masonic uh, minutes, documents, date back to the 1300s in Europe and uh, really became prevalent in Scotland. And uh, then officially, Freemasonry didn't announce itself publicly until 1717 in England. Uh, Timothy Hogan, some theorists and historians claim a link between the Knights Templars and Freemasons. Is that historically correct? Uh, certainly the Masonic um, systems suggest that there's a connection between the Knights Templar and Freemasonry. Uh, the, uh, we know that the Templars were suppressed in 1307 by the Roman Catholic Church and uh, King Philip the Fair of France. And by 1314, uh, the Knights Templar ceased to officially exist under Roman Catholic sanction. And... Uh, the Grand Master of the Templars, Jacques de Molay, was burnt at the stake. Uh, there has been widespread accounts within Masonic traditions uh, that at this point in time the Knights Templar went underground and had to disguise themselves as trade guilds and as other traditions and uh, they redeveloped themselves as Freemasonry. Okay, but this is a very important question. Why was the Catholic Church against the Knights Templars? The Knights Templars were condemned by the Catholic Church because it was believed that they were associating with traditions outside of Roman Catholic dogma at the time. For example, the Knights Templar had close relationships with certain Islamic traditions as well as uh, traditions like the Druze, uh, in places like Lebanon and Syria and uh, they were also associating with um, other Christian traditions that uh, were, were not recognized by the Roman Catholic Church at the time and because of their association with all of these different groups and because they were trading information with them and texts and to some degree, uh, there's some evidence that they were actually initiating people in the Templar order uh, from these different religious faiths. And they were protecting uh, people of all different religious faiths within Jerusalem at the time, including defending uh, Muslim right, uh, the Muslim right to worship there. Uh, they were, the Roman Catholic Church saw them as heretics and they probably also had eyes on uh, some of the Templar money 
and they uh, wanted access to some of the archives the Templars had been acquiring and consequently they declared them as heretics and uh, proceeded to uh, you know wipe them out <laughs> or try to anyways um, what is the contemporary uh, current purpose of the Freemasons what do they actually do the, tr the primary purpose of Freemasonry in this day and age is to uh, focus, take people and focus on the development of their character, uh, to focus on the development of uh, them as leaders in the world, uh, to bring about um, freedoms within the world, including uh, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, uh, you know, freedom of speech, uh, all the things that Freemasonry has believed uh, facilitates uh, useful dialogue and, and trade and builds culture in this in, in order and establishes uh, yeah peace and order in the world. Uh, but it has to start with individuals developing themselves first. And so Freemasonry focuses on the personal development in the hopes that uh, this personal development will be taken out into the world in order to uh, build a better and more stable world. And I should also point out that uh, Freemasonry uh, is composed of people of all different religious faiths who come together and will pray together um, around an altar with the understanding that each individual prays to uh, the God that they, um, you know, that their religious faith uh, teaches them to pray to. But we can come together as fraternally, as brothers, to, uh, to still build peace in the world and in mutual cooperation. Um, I interviewed a very significant author and speaker of the OTO organization. He claimed that the Freemasons used to perform magic rituals. Uh, is that correct? And do they still perform magic and rituals, magic rituals? Uh, Freemasonry itself would not say that it performs magic rituals. Uh, there are individual Freemasons that would certainly believe that uh, what they are doing is a form of magic. Um, any any form of ritual, uh, whether it be within Freemasonry or uh, within any religious tradition, uh, can be perceived uh, by some as a form of magic. But Freemasonry itself does not uh, state that it is uh, teaching magic, uh, nor does it um, uh, condone the study of magic. Uh, what Freemasonry does condone is the study of philosophy, um, the study of different comparative religions, and the study of personal and moral development. And, uh, you know, for some, they, they can view this as a, as a type of magic for certain. Um, but I don't, I don't think there's any Masonic institution on earth today that would say that they are teaching magic. Uh, there are some groups like the OTO, for example, and even Alistair Crawley was a, uh, he uh, was considered a clandestine Freemason, or in other words, he, he didn't belong to a regular system of Freemasonry. And uh, they have taken many of the Masonic symbolism and rituals and uh, degree structure and have turned it into a form of uh, magical teaching. Uh, and that's just their system and, and that's what they do. Um, and some people are attracted to that and some people are, uh, are not attracted to that. Um, and uh, some Freemasons are attracted to that, and some Freemasons are totally against that. But Freemasonry itself uh, would not say that it is teaching any form of magic. You're mentioning secrecy. Why is there secrecy and secret symbols involved 
if the Freemasons have nothing to hide? That's a that's a good uh, that's a good question. Um, actually, most of Freemasonry, most of the degrees and everything else, can be found uh, available online and in books and that type of thing. But the reason why uh, Freemasonry had these secrets uh, historically was that it was believed that people only learn in stages. And some knowledge can be con considered dangerous in the wrong hands. If someone is not ready for it, uh, it can be dangerous to themselves and others. Uh, for example, if a uh, you wouldn't want to give a, a small child a loaded gun if he doesn't know how to use it. Uh, he could end up really hurting himself and, and other people. So... Uh, Freemasonry taught in stages, and uh, there were secrets. Uh, there were secret signs and secret forms of recognition that were developed to ensure that only people who were ready were were able to advance to the next level. And some of this had to deal with um, uh, teaching. Um, certain uh, historical ideas, philosophical ideas, and more importantly, one would argue that it, it, it's for teaching um, different levels of symbolic and psychological uh, understanding, uh, you know, understanding of our own personal psychology. And if someone's not really ready to venture into their own personal psychology, uh, it can, you know, it could drive them nuts. It can it could drive them mad. Uh, if people aren't ready to look at their own fears and their own uh, who they really are and why they're here in the, in the world and what they're doing. Consequently, uh, because there were these levels of secrecy within Freemasonry and these levels of advancement and because Freemasonry itself is a is a was a closed system. In other words, you had to be, you had to be screened, and you had to be vouched for as being a person of good moral character uh, before even being invited into it, or before even being allowed to to enter into Freemasonry. Um, because it's been secret, uh, people have uh, assumed. Uh, that Freemasonry is behind all kinds of conspiracies and uh, and everything else, um, and that what's really going on in the in the lodge is uh, the discussion of of secret politics and uh, and everything else, um, when that's really not the case. Uh, also, because. Uh, Freemasonry itself has only attracted people of high moral character and value. Uh, there have been uh, prominent leaders throughout history who have been attracted to it and who have knocked on its doors and tried to become Freemasons. And many, many leaders have become Freemasons. And so when people see that, they assume that Freemas Freemasonry itself is uh, involved in, in, in plots and conspiracies, even though the, the earliest uh, Masonic constitution, which is uh, called Anderson's Constitutions, and it's from the 1700s, uh, makes it very clear that uh, Freemasonry is not to concern itself with plots and conspiracies uh, against any government. And that people are, and that Masons are supposed to be good citizens, and true to their countries in which they are supposed to become good leaders. But uh, you know, they're not supposed to be involved in these things. Um, many theorists claim that Freemasons control the world and want to start a new world order. Does this theory hold any significant th truth? Uh. I would say that it's certainly true that uh, Freemasons throughout history um, have been involved in, uh, again, building leaders and people of strong character, and they have stood for ideals, uh, again, like um, freedom of religion, 
uh, freedom of speech. They have fought for individual rights throughout history. And consequently, uh, many great um, uh, you know, leaders and even revolutionaries have been Freemasons throughout history um, because they have been fighting for these rights for people. Uh, consequently, the uh, uh, people are, are quick to assume that uh, Freemasonry is involved in these conspiracies to build a, a new world order. Um, oftentimes, uh, Freemasons will joke that uh, we're not trying to build a new world order because a new world order already exists and it's not what people think. <laughs> If you live in a country in which you have the right to to your opinion, the right to broadcast things like this show, the right to uh, be able to uh, worship the religion of your choice, then uh, you know you are living in the world that uh, Freemasons have have always envisioned. Um, but uh, no, Freemasonry is 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 not not involved. Has no interest in trying to uh, control governments and become uh, the 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 secret leaders behind world events, as as some people think. Um, the founding fathers of America were Freemasons. In the past, many people in position of power were Freemasons. Uh, shouldn't that worry many people into believing that Freemasons might really be trying to control the world, if not already controlling the world? Well, again, I, I would say that, um, yes, there have been many powerful people in the past who were Freemasons. And it's because Freemasonry attracts leaders, it attracts people who are, trying, who are interested in building a more stable world, and who are interested in developing their personal self and their personal character and their per personal knowledge of the world. And anytime you have an educated person, they're more prone to uh, be um, selected by the people into leadership positions uh, because they, they tend to know what's going on. The founding fathers of the United States, yes, many of them were uh, Freemasons. And uh, yes, the, the, it could be argued that the United States was formed as a Masonic e experiment. Uh, these were people that had fled Europe because of religious persecution. They had seen what happens when, uh, when people don't have the right to speak and when monarchs uh, are uh, controlling what people do and how trade operates and they've seen what happens when a religious institution is trying to control what people think and um, what happens when people get persecuted for their religious beliefs and so the founding fathers uh, being Freemasons many of them um, and, and standing for this idea of liberty and freedom for people uh, fought to set up the United States government as a government where people would have these freedoms uh, when people would have the freedom of expression and the, the, the free to, the, have the freedom to trade and to travel and to worship as they choose and um, you know if 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 you are against that idea, I would just say that uh, you need to ask yourself, why are you against that? Why are you afraid of people thinking for themselves and being able to speak for themselves and being able to worship as they choose? Uh, if you're having to co coerce people to worship and if you're having to force people to worship a certain way uh, by force, uh, then they're not really worshiping truly in their hearts, are they? they, they they're being forced to do something. So, um, Freemasonry was concerned with putting the power back in the hands of people, in, his, in the hands of individuals, as to being controlled by a few um, either religious or uh, 
religious leaders or monarchs or kings. Um, and uh, there is any time you, you put the hands back, the power back in the hands of the people, uh, there are great things that will come out of that. And uh, there can also be challenges that come with that. But the hope is that uh, with an educated populace, uh, they'll be able to, to build stable government and uh, be able to govern themselves accordingly. Um, since the founding of the United States, there have been other leaders who, who have been Freemasons, who have fought for uh, people's liberties. And there have been tyrants throughout history who have always tried to suppress Freemasonry uh, because it has stood for these freedoms. A good example is uh, Adolf Hitler in the in the Nazi Party during World War II. Uh, they they were specifically trying to attack Freemasonry and were trying to suppress Freemasonry. And if you were an SS officer, you had to take an oath that you were because it was a tyrannical system, and they were trying to control the thought of the people, and they didn't want to allow free speech. And because Freemasonry stood for these things, uh, they tried to suppress it. So Freemasonry has always uh, tried to fight for the for the people, and for the voice of the people, and for these freedoms. And consequently, there have been uh, leaders, many uh, leaders throughout history that have been uh, Freemasons that have stood for, for these ideals and have tried to implement them in their form of leadership and in their form of governing. Okay, a very important question. Uh, what does the Eye of Horus stand for, which is imprinted on the dollar bill and which is also a Freemasonic symbol? Yeah, within Freemasonry, uh, we do find the all-seeing eye as a prominent symbol. It is, uh, within most lodges in the world, it is found in the east of the lodge, uh, the east part of the lodge where the, where the master of the lodge sits. Uh, and uh, it's also found within most Masonic degree instruction. And it just represents the eye of uh, the Almighty, the, the eye of the Creator who is always watching us and always watching our endeavors. Uh, within Freemasonry, uh, uh, we, we tend to refer to the, the Creator as, as the grand architect of the universe, only because it is a, a, a more generic term that uh, people of all different faiths can relate to. Um, whereas uh, one religion may refer to the Grand Architect as Allah, others may refer to him as Yahweh, uh, others may just refer to him as God, but by calling it the Grand Architect we can all agree. And what we say is that uh, that eye of deity, that eye of the Grand Architect, is always, is always watching us. And so when the Founding Fathers created the Great Seal of the United States, they put that eye uh, representing the, um, the idea that uh, the Creator is always watching us, and is always watching our endeavors, and is always watching what we're doing. Uh, Later, much later, that great seal was put on the American currency, on the $1 bill of the United States, by Frank, the President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was, who was a Freemason. Uh, it has been suggested that it was, um, that his spiritual advisor, a man by the name of Nicholas Rorick, was the one who suggested that it be put there. Uh, and the idea behind it was that uh, if it was on the American currency, uh, people would always think twice about how they were spending their money and would always keep the great architect in mind with the idea that the creator is always a part of our actions in the world and that is always, he is always watching what we do. And we would be uh, more conscious of the fact that of how we're spending our money. Uh, since that time, many conspiracy theorists have tried to suggest that it was 
put on there to represent the the control of the government uh, always watching people but uh, that was never the intention behind it uh, the, the intention behind it was the idea that God was always watching or, or the, the, the creator the grand architect was always watching our endeavors uh, it is true that this same symbol of the of the eye can be found going back into many uh, ancient civilizations, both in the eastern and western uh, hemispheres, uh, and you find it uh, certainly in ancient Egypt with the eye of Horus. Uh, in Egyptian myths, they taught that the uh, the eye that Horus had two eyes, and that uh, throughout the journey of his development he his consciousness traveled from one eye to the other eye uh, with the idea that um, he was able to gain a, a bigger perspective a, a more divine perspective. This is a similar idea of um, our own personal journey uh, but also uh, the idea that that larger divine perspective or that that uh, larger perspective of the Creator uh, is is always watching us and we should always keep it in mind. Okay, Timothy, last question. Does the Freemasons have any sort of uh, connection with the Illuminati since, you know, they have similar symbolism and etc.? Do they have any sort of connection with the Illuminati? Yeah, there, you know, there were several different traditions that referred to themselves as Illuminati uh, over the centuries. The one that's most... Um, widely known about is an organization that was established by Adam Weishaupt uh, in the late 1700s, the known as the Bavarian Illuminati. Uh, but yes, uh, the you know the Illuminati uh, was set up. The Bavarian Illuminati was set up uh, with a degree structure similar to Freemasonry. And uh, many of its members were, in fact, Freemasons. And there was a close connection there for, uh, you know, a period of time, for several decades, uh, between the Bavarian Illuminati system and uh, the regular uh, Masonic systems of the time. And consequently, there was the sharing of thought that occurred uh, and there was the sharing of symbolism that occurred. Um, the original goals of the Bavarian Illuminati uh, which which were similar to Freemasonry were, were the idea that, uh, that they believed that uh, the Roman Catholic Church at the time had too much power and they also believed uh, that there needed to be that the monarchs of the time had too much power and that there needed to be more uh, power within the hands of the people and that there needed to be more freedoms and rights to worship uh, allow people to worship as they chose and so consequently the um, the Bavarian Illuminati at the time uh, was involved in teaching uh, and uh, propagating the idea that people should have these rights. And, and consequently, the Roman Catholic Church at the time and the, uh, the monarchies of the time uh, really made them out to be horrible uh, devil worshippers and uh, evil and, uh, and made them out to be people who were trying to take over the governments of the world. And that myth uh, has has continued to exist to this day uh, with the idea that uh, in the, these were ideas that uh, the monarchies and the, and, the, and the church systems that were being replaced at the time put out there as a form of propaganda to try to discredit the Illuminati. Um, but yes, the, you know there were there 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 was. Uh, a lot of crossover of symbolism and uh, also um, similar degree structures 
in terms of uh, levels of advancement within both the Illumin Bavarian Illuminati and within uh, Freemasonry. And many people believe that there was a, a cross-exchange of ideas that occurred at that time which continue to exist to this day. Thank you so much, uh, Timothy Hogan, for being on our show. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for having me. This was Timothy Hogan, a 32-grade Grandmaster Freemason. We were discussing the topic of Inside the Freemasonry. Until the next episode, this is Zan Khan. Take care and goodbye.